I think a lot of people are wrong about what a killer app is. And um, this is something that I've been thinking about pretty regularly ever since I got the Apple Vision Pro. Um, I started off this channel really thinking about apps and the way that they uh, influence a platform and how they become and what apps end up selling uh, these devices and which ones fail to do that. And I guess today I really want to think about who should buy Apple Vision Pro and how that intersects with the idea that we have, this sort of mental model that we have of killer apps. Now, a big reason for this is because Spatial Personas just came out. Um, there's a huge amount of interest in it because it is really Apple's let me put it this way. MKBHD in his review mentioned that FaceTime felt like the most futuristic application on Apple Vision Pro. This is when personas were locked inside of essentially a little square, like the same thing as a FaceTime call, but uh, in 3D out in the world, right? When Apple turned on spatial personas, it changes that. It puts things on its head because what happens is that these personas end up leaving their windows. And like that is really the thing about this device is that it's about the apps leaving their windows. And that is also the thing that killer apps do the best. They unlock a new use case by utilizing a feature of the device that previous forms of computing could not do. Um, I think that that is why... I'm thinking about killer apps right now. Uh, but more importantly, I think that it's important to ask the question, finally, and two months in, who should buy the Apple Vision Pro? You're about to see a few people learn to use one of the newest, most advanced business computers in the world. Honestly, like, if you ask me, like, who should buy the Vision Pro right now? My honest answer is nobody. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I would. I honestly, the more the more I've owned it, the more I've shown it to other people, the more we see that there's no content. Who should buy the Vision Pro right now? My answer really is nobody. The computer for the rest of us. No, I would I would disagree. I think it's frequent travelers who do not care about being that person. But it sucks as a travel device. It's too big and clunky. Like it's, uh, it's I don't know there's, if I agree there's with that. no there's no nothing equivalent to that except for other similar product other similar VR products. Like a, the the VR experience in a plane, you need a VR thing to do. And the Vision Pro is an expensive one, and there are a couple of cheaper ones that are similar. But I can see that. Like it, it, it's it's an early adopter product at this point. So I've had this thing for a couple months now. Um, I've used it pretty regularly, and I've done my best to push the bounds of the device on nearly a daily basis, right? Using native apps, using it with a keyboard, without a keyboard, using traditional apps, using the iPad apps on there, uh, casting my Mac screen and using the Mac virtual display, calling people on uh, FaceTime, both in the situation of uh, calling like someone with an iPhone and so, and then also calling people with Apple Vision Pro. And um, I've pushed the bounds of it in social use cases, in individual use cases, and in personal use cases. And I've done all of that because that is the exciting thing. And that's why we, I created this channel in the first place, right? Is because I figure that this thing represents a shift in the way that we will do computing in the future. And with a new device, I think people underestimate just how many of the little details affect the bigger picture, especially when it comes to a device that is as high profile as this one is, especially in the community. Now, I've hesitated making this video because the answer to the question that we're asking today has kind of continually puzzled me. Uh, like, who is this thing for? Why does it exist? Uh, what does Apple see as, as its use case? And, uh, you know, a lot of people have called it a developer kit. So, you know, the most charitable read of this thing is this is a developer kit. Yeah. And so they're going to build all these, and they're, and they're yet to come. And, and I think that you, if you want to be really fair to this thing, that's how you think about it. But Apple's positioning of the thing, the thing they're asking it to do, the ad they put out is like people wearing it while they're just like hanging out doing laundry and a call comes in. 
And you're like, what is the value of wearing this if it's not doing anything for you? And the value should be a bunch of AR stuff, not I'm waiting for the phone to ring. And I, there's again, there's a real tension between the ambition of the product and how it's being communicated and the reality of the product. Yeah. Talk about nostalgia. I don't get nostalgia for the computers. I mean, sometimes I appreciate their design, but again, you, I use them all. And they, they, they're better now. So it really, it's hard to get nostalgia. Like, I have a 12-inch PowerBook, which was my favorite Mac of all time. It's so thick. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure if I used it, it would be so slow using some old version of OS X. I'm, I do get nostalgic for the feeling I had back then. Yes. And, and they need to figure out what it's for. And it took them three generations to get there. Mm -hmm. And they totally rebooted the software. And I was like, no one will ever... And like for a long time, people were like, you were just unnecessarily harsh. And this time, like literally there are screenshots comparing my two reviews, yeah. being like, oh, this is the same exact thing. And I, the only thing I will remind everyone of is, one, I was right. I don't always <laughs> remind you of that. No, but two, the, the path wasn't set when the thing was launched. I wonder, do you think that this is the kind of thing where they were trying to decide if they were going to release it as a sort of a, more of a developer kit and try and get more people on board, and then they were waffling between what to do and finally decided to ship it for public release and just don't have enough content. The watch hardware was very close. And then the question is, how do we make this thing into what it ought to be inside of this box? And Apple usually gets the box right. In this case, neither one of them is right. I don't know. I Because I don't, it's so... I know people have used that phrase developer kit so often with this, but that's so unlike Apple. OS X, I was there at the start. And those early years of OS X were a wild ride because it was, like, first off, there was, like, the classic environment where you had, like, apps that, like, ran a virtual machine of OS 9 in OS X. So Apple was virtualizing itself, and, like, it was so weird, and that there were, like, features missing, and and then they would add them, and then like we did, ten one came out, and we're like, oh, people could maybe use it now, like because literally in ten o, we're like, well, no, I'm using it, but you should not use this, right? And then or you reboot into OS nine to get your job done, and then with with uh, with ten one, we're like, oh, I think you could do it now, but like then ten two would come out, and a bunch of those other things that you used to use in Mac OS that were not there anymore came back, and it was all a little bit faster because it started out being so slow and like i am nostalgic for that era because it was super groundbreaking for the mac and that was really fun and the mac hasn't been super groundbreaking like that for a while and this is just like such a developer kit that yeah. i keep like i keep thinking about that a lot like it feels like such a developer kit um but like that's why i'm excited about vision pro is like vision pro is a, a weird early product it is it is kind of a developer kit and early adopter kind of thing. And it's going to change and grow and in strange ways. And like, that's why I do tech is because it's fun. But like the stuff is so much better that I, I have no nostalgia for using an old slow version of OS X. Was it Wired that ran the story where yes. Roni Bromovitz was like, I'm hacking the GPU of your brain? Yep. <laughs> like, we've just been here, man. <laughs> like, uh and so I think Apple can't say it's a developer kit. They can't place themselves in the long line of companies that have been doing this for a long. They have to say it's finished, and which is why they have to they have to have entertainment. And they have to do this. James Cameron is in that Manny Fair piece quoted as saying, this will change everything. And it's like, dude, you have done more scuba diving VR than anybody. People don't buy computers. They buy apps, right? And that is kind of the gist of what they're getting at. In the beginning, the thing that's interesting about a computer is that it is this general purpose device. It's it's crazy. Like you could do essentially anything on a computer, right? It, it, it can model almost anything. It can represent almost anything. It has almost unlimited use cases. It's why I got into computers in the first place is because they're unlike any other tool that we have ever created as humans. And, and their flexibility is extremely profound in, in, in what they are able to do, right? But because of that, their flexibility also at the beginning is sometimes their, 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 their downfall. Uh, 
there's this idiom um, that people sometimes bring up when they talk about programming, and it's that software takes discipline, right? Uh, and it's because of that flexibility, it's because of that breadth of, of possibilities with a device that that is an interesting thing to say, right? So what I mean by that is that at the beginning, computers on their own don't, they don't do anything, right? You have to make them do something and they can do anything, right? Which is the interesting part. But you have to have the discipline to choose the thing that they do. And then ultimately, if you're trying to sell the device to people, those people need to know what the thing can do. So I want you to think back to the iPhone. Uh, the iPhone was a phone, an iPod, and a web browser, right? Combining those three things was a use case in itself. It sold the device. That application of a phone combined with an iPod combined with a web browser, those are three killer apps rolled into one on the iPhone. And that, I think, is why it sold so much. It's something that everyone wanted to do. Everyone wanted to make phone calls. Everyone wanted music on the go. And everyone wanted to reach the web. And those were all in a single device. It's kind, it was kind of incredible when you think about the things that were rolled together into one product. But let's think about the iPod, right? The precursor to the iPhone. The iPod alone was a killer app in itself, right? It really it wasn't even a general purpose computer. It, it took some of the core of their of Apple's technological leanings, but really it only had one killer app, which was a thousand songs in your pocket, music, right? But even the iMac, which preceded both of those, it also had a killer app and was the reason why Apple was able to come back from the brink of death, uh, and that was web access to the web, or the web browser, right? Um, every one of those products came in a succession after Jobs came back, and in my opinion, were successful, and I think in many people's opinion, were successful because they had killer apps from the beginning. They were built, in a lot of ways, those computers were built around a killer app from the beginning, and Jobs had the instinct and the insight to wrap the computer around the app and work backwards from there. But I want to just nail this home that I think that there is kind of a misconception about what a killer app is. Some people think that a killer app is just like a really cool feature of a device that makes you want to get it. That's one, that's one thing people have said about the spatial personas. They're like, is this the killer app? And the answer is maybe, right? That is one aspect of it. But other people think that a killer app is just an app on a device that is so successful that it makes you want to get it. And to an extent, that's also true. We'll talk about examples of that uh, uh, later on here, right? But I do think it's a little more nuanced than that. Yes, a killer app does, it, it, they, they can be a cool feature of a device. That's exactly what I talked about with the iPod music, right? Or the iMac, the web browser, right? Or the iPhone, a combination of those two and a phone. But I think the more important and the more interesting thing about a killer app is that it's actually a description of something that is an economic reality, right? Or a market reality or a business reality rather than a, a technical one, if that makes any sense. So killer apps, in my mind, or for this discussion, are something, are, is an application that spearheads a computer into a new market, right? Um, we can take those three examples again and apply that there. For example, with the iMac, the web browser was something that people wanted. If you think about when the iMac was released, right, this is an era where the web was kind of skyrocketing in popularity. People were coming onto the web at an extremely fast rate. And so in order to do that, they needed a computer, yes, but more importantly, they needed a web browser, right? And the iMac was essentially a glorified way to get on the internet. In getting on the internet, right, it just so happened that Apple got them a computer in front of their face, right? But the web was the killer app for the iMac. What about the iPod? iPod's another good example. The iPod is interesting because it was a killer app in itself. It was selling a music player, a thousand songs in your pocket, 
And in fact, the iPod wasn't even a general purpose computing device in the same way that the Mac was. And so it was technology, but people were buying the app, not the computer. But even with the iMac, people mostly were buying the app, not the computer. In fact, when we think about how apps are a trajectory into a market or a spearhead into a market, that is exactly the story of Apple's second computer, the Apple II. Part of what we really want to do is, is recreate the Apple II phenomenon. There are several thousand extremely bright and talented software developers doing software for the Apple II, and it's an incredible competitive advantage. In the software business, volume is everything. You want to be able to sell into onto a large set of machines. Microsoft is choosing this Apple Macintosh environment because over time the other environments won't be interesting. The technology that's in Macintosh makes it possible for us to move the state of the art ahead in software. We can really do something that's of value to people, to lots and lots of people, that we simply couldn't do before. And that's what's exciting, and that's why we're in business. So we're going to devote at least half of our R&D resources developing software specifically for the Macintosh. And I, would, I wouldn't do that unless I really believed in, one, the product, and secondly, that, uh, that we had a chance to have an outstanding relationship with Apple. So the Apple II created was a follow-up to the Apple I. It was the first com second computer Apple made following up their first one. And um, ultimately, it was designed for a small hobbyist group that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were a part of. It was designed to be a great computer. Uh, it was at the very beginning of the microcomputer revolution, um, taking these big chunky machines and turning them into more of an appliance, right? Um, it was one of the first computers that was all packaged up into a nice tidy box that you could just plug in and start using as long as you know how to code. And because it was a very powerful machine, a programmer took this machine and invented the spreadsheet. VisiCalc was the, it's like the first example of what people call a killer app, right? They invented the spreadsheet on this device because it was the only device that was feasibly able to do what this creator wanted, right? And eventually, VisiCalc, the spreadsheet, became such a must-have app for small businesses that the app, VisiCalc, sold Apple IIs. Here's what I mean by that. People started to hear, small businesses started to hear what a spreadsheet could do for their business. The fact that it was automatically tabulating these results, that it was uh, what you see is what you get interface, that it was relatively easy to use, and that it had huge advantages over traditional methods of computing and cal or doing actual computation. I mean, I'm, we're talking like uh, a calculator type computation, right? And so everyone wanted it. Everybody wanted the spreadsheet. And so in order to get the spreadsheet, in order to get VisiCalc, what did they have to do? They had to buy an Apple II. That is what a killer app is. And I think that that is what is missed by a lot of people, that what happened first is that people wanted to buy the application. But in a lot of ways, the thing between the person and the application is the computer. That's an important thing to remember. Between the person and the application is the computer. And in order to get to the application, you need the computer first. So that is why killer apps spearhead things into new markets. It's because the app is so good or so useful for something that people are willing to pay an upfront cost, the computer, both learning the computer, a monetary cost of the computer, everything else in order to get to the useful application. The spreadsheet, VisiCalc, was a killer app because it spearheaded this uh, computer into a new market, which was small businesses. Remember, the Apple II was designed for a small group of essentially nerds, right? Programmers, tinkerers, people who would build their own little computers out of the uh, in, uh, individual components, right? But it caught on in a market beyond hobbyists, beyond developers, because there was an application that the general market, in this case, small businesses, wanted to get to. 
And because of that, I, I really think it's important to remember that it's kind of rare that any computer only has one killer app, right? Why is that the case? The reason is because killer apps are just an excuse to buy a computer, right? And different markets need different apps, right? So every different every market has a, needs a different excuse to buy, right? The hobbyist doesn't buy a computer for the same reason a small business does. And a small business doesn't buy a computer for the same reason that a consumer does. And not every consumer buys a computer for the same reason, right? Just as an example, to go back through history, small businesses bought Apple IIs because it allowed them to do something that they could never do before, manage their books and prevent tedious calculations in a interactive and intuitive way. Publishers bought Macs at the beginning because it allowed them to visually edit and print publications without the tedious work of doing that stuff physically, desktop publishing. Again, people bought iMacs because it let them, let them easily connect to the web. They could plug it in and connect to the web through the web browser. People bought iPods because it let them carry a thousand songs in their pocket. And people bought iPhones because it let them consolidate all of the things that were in their pocket, the MP3 player, the phone, and then actually can, beyond that, have access to the web. People buy apps, not computers. Every single one of these devices branched into those new markets because they had an application that spearheaded the hardware into that market. People don't buy computers, they buy apps. But there is one exception to this rule. John, John, let me just add a little bit to it because it's, it's no accident we did this at WWDC, right? It's a developer conference, right? right? Yeah. You know, this is the idea. Is you know, just like our opening video, where the thought bubbles, you know, go above developers' heads and they and they chase those ideas. That's what we want to start here. You know, and you even saw a taste of it. I mean, Susan Prescott in her section showed, you know, uh, PTC doing the that that car, that yeah. Alfa Romeo car. I'm telling you, when you see that in headset, you swear to God it's real. I mean, to the point where. You know, you're because you can get in it, right? You can get in it, and you're like, "Why is it not supporting my back?" <laughs> they have so, a, yeah, Mike's yeah. working on that part. Uh, you know, you know, you know, oh, you know. It's just unbelievable stuff. Or that, or that assembly line that you put in your room. I mean, things remember don't have to be in Windows. It's great that a lot of apps work in Windows, and that's it's amazing, and that's you know, those all work. And yeah. like Mike said, we'll have hundreds of thousands of things that work today that'll go in here. And, you know, Microsoft even brought their stuff over. People are excited, but stuff doesn't have to live in Windows. You saw the Mindfulness app, and that's a nice one because it shows you that digital content can be all around you. It can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be put in a, in a rectangle. Uh, so, yeah, we're pretty excited about where it's going to go. We've already had a lot of enterprises already expressing interest. They yeah, think and, this is and, cool. and we've made this platform extremely easy for folks to develop for. I mean, we put an immense amount of effort in there yeah. for developers. Yeah. So if you're an iOS developer. Developers, yeah. nerds are the exception, right? Most people don't buy computers because they don't have a use for a computer until there's an app that proves a use for the computer, right? They need apps to prove that the computer is useful. Developers are different though. Hobbyists or enthusiasts are different because they think of the computer as an application in itself. And that's because they can harness the power of the computer, the flexibility of the computer to ends of their own. They're excited about the technology. They want to be on the cutting edge. I made a video uh, about Zuckerberg's approach with Quest um, and Meta's approach just in general to what Zuck sees as the metaverse, which is essentially the web for VR. Uh, and I compared it against Apple's approach with Apple Vision Pro and uh, kind of a more subtle, simple, personal approach that Apple is taking. And uh, that became the inspiration for this video along with the clip at the beginning from ATP. And it sent me down a deep dive. And um, this is what I talked about in the beginning. I have been thinking a lot about what the Apple Vision Pro is most like in Apple's history. What is, in other words, what is the best yardstick to use when thinking about this device? Is it the iPhone? 
the iPhone is a hugely successful product. It is the best recent example of an Apple product that is sort of the next step in a long trajectory of historical successes for Apple. I think it's tempting. A lot of people, I think, are using the iPhone as a measuring stick, or even the iPad to some extent. But I don't think that's fair. Um, because, again, those two things, or even the watch, actually, to some level, those two products, those three products, all launched as applications in their own right. Actually, I mean, I guess the watch, now that I think about it, maybe is less of an example. That's kind of what The Verge was pointing out. But the iPhone and the it was like a great example, and the iPod are great examples of things that launched as killer apps in their own, which make them not great examples. Let's talk about the watch and the iPad. The watch was the example that The Verge used, right? And it has not had the same level of impact that the phone or the iPod did, in my opinion, just because of the nature of a watch. There's only so much computing that you can do on a device this size. So what about the iPad? Well, the iPad, I think, is the closest parallel. And a lot of people have talked about it. I've talked about it before. And this is probably not the video to discuss it necessarily. But it is the closest thing to this device. And I guess I would argue that this is an outgrowth of the iPad. So let's just table the iPad as a, as a discussion for now. So let's go back even further. The iMac. The iMac is an interesting comparison because the iMac was a general purpose computer and it uh, it came at a time when Apple needed a successful product. It came at a time when jobs were returning. And initially I thought that maybe like the Apple Vision Pro would be a good comparison to the iMac. But actually, I don't think so. Because really, the iMac was a work of art <laughs> by Jobs. It was the evolution of the Mac, kind of making good on the promise uh, of 1984. And um, Jobs had the experience at the time to know that it needed a killer app in itself to sell the product. And really, in my opinion, that was the web and the web browser. They were lucky to launch the iMac at a time when people needed an easy computer to get on the web. But what about further back? So if the iMac isn't a good comparison, if my initial instinct to compare it to the iMac isn't correct, then what is? Well, we could think about the Mac, and I think the Mac is an interesting one. But when I think about the market that the Mac was supposed to reach, it was supposed to reach the knowledge worker. And in that way, it actually is an interesting comparison. The Mac was a paradigm shift. It took the command line interface and shifted the paradigm to the graphical user interface. In a lot of ways, the Apple Vision Pro is similar. It's taking a graphical user interface, a two-dimensional user interface, and shifting the paradigm to a three-dimensional one. That is an interesting comparison, and I've made the comparison before, um, and eventually that will deserve its own video. But I'm going to go further back. The thing that preceded the Mac, which was the Apple II. The Apple II um, is exactly what we talked about. It was a computer launched to hobbyists that caught on because of, the, of a one of those hobbyists in two, in. I don't know what you would call it, creativity, their intuition, their uh, 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 competitive spirit, their uh, innovative nature, right? And the hobbyists are the ones that end up selling the, the device in the long run. But remember, it was Apple's second computer. computer. <laughs> it was the follow-up to the Apple I. And the Apple I, right, was launched to a very similar group. So let me give you a quick history of the Apple one. Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, buddies from high school, go start going to the homebrew computer club. This story has been told a million times, but I'll recount it here. Homebrew was a small group uh, uh, of, of tinkerers, hobbyists, that uh, was in Silicon Valley, all interested in kind of making, it, it was the group that really birthed the idea of the personal computer, 
right? Again, computers before were these big hunk, hunking machines, right? They were these big things, communal in a lot of ways, by nature, because they were these big shared resources. But the movement to microcomputers and eventually personal computers was spearheaded by, let's just say for now, homebrew. They wanted to take this, these smaller processors and wrap these consoles around them to make it so that computers could be something that individuals owned as appliances rather than shared communal resources. And so Jobs and Wozniak are inspired by this group. They are a part of the conversation. And they eventually, Wozniak ends up making this little board that he calls the Apple One, right? shows it off to the group, develops it in the open to this group over time, and uh, eventually gains the interest of these people. Now, eventually, Jobs would take that board and start to build a business around it, sell it to people, right? But remember, the audience that the Apple One launched to was a group of hobbyists, developers, nerds, right? I can I bring this up because I think that Apple Vision Pro is very similar to that. Similar to the Apple One and the Apple Two. Apple Vision Pro is a profound paradigm shift. And I think it is underestimated by a lot of people just how profound it is. Even with the level of excitement that people have. I'm going to make a video about this in the future. But the Apple Vision Pro is the last computer Apple is ever going to make. Um... Virtual reality is the last, is the, it's the final form of the personal computer. It really is. And because of that, it is profound inherently. If the Apple One was the start of the personal computer, then the Apple Vision Pro is the end. And in this kind of beautiful way, there is a symmetry in the way that these two devices mirror one another. The Apple One was launched to a group of hobbyists. It ended up being iterated on, creating the Apple Two, and then the Apple Two ended up spearheading the personal computer to the general public through VisiCalc. I think that Apple Vision Pro is also being launched to hobbyists. I think that that is who Apple thinks of this market as. There's a reason that it's a low volume product at an extremely exp expensive price point. $3,500, right? That's a crazy amount of money to spend on a computer. But people who are really interested in the technology, who are hobbyists, who are nerds, who are developers, they are going to get this thing. And they'll start realizing that there are applications for this device that simply cannot be done on any device of the previous paradigm, which is a two-dimensional user interface. Because of that, I think that something similar is going to happen. You know, uh, let's see. The Apple One launched in, let's see, 1976. VisiCalc launched in 1979. It took three years to go from the first iteration of the personal computer to get to the point where the computer had something to do, where it had an app that people would buy. I wouldn't be surprised if Apple Vision Pro is the same if it takes three years or more. Because guess what? People have to poke around. I think that it's Ben Thompson and Stratechery that has talked about kind of the beauty of the name Vision. Because this really is how Apple operates when they think about a vision for a product. They have an idea in their mind. They, they put the pedal to the metal and they work from the ground up, building the, hard, the supply chain, the hardware, and the software to get it to market. That is what a vision is to them. And they, they put their money where their mouth is. They're also willing to run ahead and to fail, to push technological windows open through that hard work. And they're also willing to subsidize the effort of innovating through their previous successes. That is who Apple is at their core. Starting from the Apple I, all the way to the Apple II, through to the Mac, through to the iMac, the iPod, the iPhone, and then the iPad. And now Apple Vision Pro. 
And because of that, I'm not concerned. So who is this thing for? Well, I think that Apple thinks it's for hobbyists. A small tidbit to close things out. In the beginning, the Apple One sold for $666.66, and all of the imbued meaning aside, if you take a look at the price of the Apple One when it was released in 2023 dollars when this thing was, you know, basically being announced, it cost about $3,600, <laughs> the same price as Apple Vision Pro. So when we talk about symmetry, I really can't help but think that this thing is meant for nerds. And that's just about it.